Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for this Animode short lesson. This is our introduction lesson on the kingdom of God. When we look back at the Simple 7 lesson, um, number four in the simple, se simple 7 was that Jesus Christ established a kingdom, the kingdom of God. This is the church. Christ founded the Catholic Church in order to continue his work of redemption for all time. Part of his work was to teach. And so the Catholic Church teaches, and what is it that they're teaching? They're teaching a tradition, what has been handed down, what we call the deposit of faith. Um, Jesus Christ handed these teachings, of course, handed this over to the apostles. The apostles handed this over to his disciples, and we have been handing over this teaching um, continually for 2,000 years. This handing over, what we call tradition, the handing over of the teachings, the passion, death, and resurrection, all the teachings of our Lord, um, was first, of course, done orally, and then it was written down. Um, and this is probably very similar to how you may have received the faith, that someone told you the faith, someone told you the story of Jesus Christ, his passion, his death, his resurrection, the simple, what we call the kerygma, the simple kernel of faith, um, the basics, and then you probably understood a little bit more that this was written down. And so this is also the case with the church. It's an oral tradition and also a written tradition. In this particular lesson, we're going to be talking about the written tradition, which is the New Testament, um, also the written tradition of the Old Testament, but particularly how the church interprets that the Old Testament comes to fulfillment in the New and in the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. So when we see here, just to better understand the Bible, we have an Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament consists of 46 books, and then we have the New Testament. The New Testament consists of 27 books. The totality of these books uh, was established in a list, what we call a canon, and that was actually established by the Catholic Church in 397 A.D., so when we look at this, um, just a little bit of math here, we see that Jesus died in 33 AD. Well, then this uh, canon of the official list of the Bible was not formed until 397. And so this is a good 360 years that the church um, taught orally. And then in 397 AD, we have this written scripture. Um, when we look at the Old Testament, we are particularly going to be looking at the story of Animode. This is going to be the story of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. And we're going to talk about how all of these stories in the Old Testament point us to the E, which stands for Emmanuel, Epiphany, and Eucharist, which is all centered on the person of Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Jesus' story will be found in the Gospels, which are the four books of the 27, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the Gospels. Um, so when we look at this, this is what we call typology or also called salvation history. It's probably important here to, to stop the video and write down these verses and then read these because this is how the church has taught. This is how Jesus has taught. This is how even in the Old Testament they taught through the narrative, through the story, salvation history. And then particularly in the New Testament, what we call typology where everything in the Old Testament was then pointing to the New Testament, pointing to Jesus Christ. So you look here, Wisdom 10, 1 through 21, uh, Jesus' own teaching in Luke 24, St. Stephen, the first martyr of the faith in Acts 7. This is how St. Peter taught. This is how St. Paul taught, um, Acts 10 and Acts 13. So all we're going to be doing in this short little intro is we're going to take 20 events, um, either people, places, um, events in the Old Testament, and we're going to go ahead and show how they come to completion in the New Testament. The first Old Testament uh, event is creation. Genesis 1, it will find its completion in the resurrection. Jesus Christ makes all things new. In Genesis 3, we have the tree and the fruit in the garden. That will come to its fulfillment in the cross and the Eucharist. And then we have the sacrifice of Abel, which will come to its completion in the sacrifice of the Mass. And so with these, we see that Jesus Christ makes all things new. All those who put on Christ in baptism are a new creation. This is why Sunday is the Feast of the Resurrection. It is the first day of the week. Um, we look back at the tree and the fruit. Through a tree, we were enslaved. And through a holy cross, we have been set free. The fruit of a tree led us astray. 
the Son of God brought us back. And so this is what we would call kind of an anti-type, a reversal, an undoing. Um, we see the sacrifice of Abel is mentioned in the Mass. As God was pleased to accept the gifts of Abel, may he be pleased to accept the gifts upon the altar. And so we kind of have the bookends here of the first sacrifice that was pleasing to God, the sacrifice of Abel, and then the sacrifice that is now pleasing to God and pleasing to God for all eternity, which is the very sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is represented to us at each and every Mass. In the Old Testament, we see the Ark of Noah, that all those that were in the Ark were saved from the flood. And then we see the Catholic Church, the Ark of Peter, which is the instrument of salvation. We see four couples emerging from the Ark in the Old Testament. And we see that God started everything over with marriage. And so we're going to focus there on, in the New Testament, the sacrament of matrimony. Um, so with this, we see that um, Jesus Christ um, says in the Gospels, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So just as those in the Ark of Noah did not perish in the flood, those in the Ark of Peter, the church will not perish. Those that stay in the church will not perish. Um, God starts creation anew with four married couples. They were endowed with such a blessing that was not withdrawn by original sin nor by the sentence of the flood. So what do we see that God did not take away marriage? Um, when Adam and Eve committed the first sin, and then when the world became so wicked that it was flooded, God still preserved marriage, and he also still uh, preserved the blessing of having children be fertile and multiply. In the Old Testament, the people were united with one people and one language. In the Catholic Church, we see this as the communion of saints. Um, those people rebelled against God in the Tower of Babel, uh, we see the opposite of this in the building up of the temple of God. And so with uh, this, uh, we see you have redeemed us, Lord God, with your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us into a kingdom of our God. So true unity comes, of course, through Jesus Christ. This is a unity of every tribe, every tongue, every people and every nation. And so when people try to unite themselves without God, it is going to be in vain. Um, this is why the communion of saints is such an important teaching in the church. Um, we see that the one people in one language rebelled against God at the Tower of Babel. The opposite, of course, of that will be the building up of the temple of God. At Babel, man united to build his own tower to challenge God. Now the baptized faithful as living stones united by the Holy Spirit are built up in the temple of God. Circumcision in the Old Testament, which is the covenant between God and Abraham, will be fulfilled by the sacrament of baptism. We see in the Old Testament we have Sodom and Gomorrah and the purging of evil and wickedness. This, of course, we will be purged of our wickedness and evilness, our sin and penance and purgatory. And then we have the story of Abraham and Isaac, which is the story of the father and a son and this most perfect love of God the Father and God the Son. So we look at these, uh, we look at some of the prayers and, and insights of the church. Look mercifully on the devotion of thy people about to be reborn and grant that the thirst of their faith may, by the sacrament of baptism, hollow their souls and their bodies. Um, with this, we see that circumcision will make a permanent mark on the body. Baptism will make a permanent mark on the soul. Um, in, the, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, we see that God is purging a city of wickedness. How will God purge us of our sins? This will be through the sacrament of penance, but also it will be done uh, through purgatory. And then, of course, we move to this beautiful story of Abraham and Isaac, which is in Genesis 22. Um, and we see that this foreshadows, it points us to the Trinity. Father Almighty, eternal God, who together with thy only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit art one God, one Lord, not in the oneness of a single person, but in the trinity of one substance. So especially in this story, we see the Father giving the gift of the Son and the Son giving the gift of himself to the Father, um, this exchange of love. In the Old Testament, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Jacob's name will be changed to Israel, and he will have 12 sons. This prefigures Jesus and the 12 apostles. Joseph, one of those 12 sons, will be betrayed by his brothers, just as Jesus is betrayed by one of his 12 apostles, Judas. The 12 apostles of Jesus will become the first bishops of the church, the shepherds of the church. Um, Jesus says, This is the faithful and wise steward who the Lord sets over his family 
to give them their measure of wheat in due season. So these 12 apostles uh, lead the church and continue the mission of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I send you. Um, we see, of course, one of those apostles, uh, Judas, betrays Jesus. My, my friend betrayed me by the token of a kiss. Whom I shall kiss, that is he. Hold him fast. That was the wicked token which he gave, who by a kiss accomplished murder. Perhaps one of the greatest stories in the Old Testament is that of Moses and the liberation of the Israelite people, centered around the Paschal Lamb. Um, and this, of course, will point us towards the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. You have the crossing of the Red Sea, the miracle of the manna, and the giving of the law, which points us to the sacraments of initiation. And then the gift of the law at Pentecost, um, which took place in the desert, um, which, of course, then points us to um, the second Pentecost, the Holy Spirit and confirmation. So when we look at these, these are so important, especially in the sense of the sacraments, the seven sacraments that Jesus Christ has given his church um, as a way to sanctify us, to make us holy. Um, so two phrases here that come out, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who taketh away the sins of the world. These are the words of John the Baptist. They are spoken at each mass by the priest. The response to that is, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof. Speak but the word and my soul shall be healed. These are the words of the centurion and these are the words that the congregation says at Mass. So central to the Mass, central to our faith, is the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is the pure, unblemished Lamb that is slain to take away our sins. And just as the Israelites were saved from um, Pharaoh and Egypt and the slavery of sin um, in the Old Testament by the Paschal Lamb, we are going to be liberated um, from the devil, from the world, from the slavery of sin by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Um, this great crossing of the Red Sea, the miracle of the manna, the giving of the law, it is so glorious. It's the central event. And so let us sing to the Lord, for he is gloriously honored. The horse and the rider he hath thrown into the sea. He has become my helper and protector unto salvation. This is exactly what the sacraments do for us. Um, they help us cross over. Um, the baptism is like crossing through the waters of the Red Sea. We cross through the waters of baptism. We are fed by the Eucharist just as they were fed by the manna. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit just as they receive the gift of the law. And what do these sacraments do for us? Well, our Lord, who is working through these sacraments and have given us the sacraments, he is our helper, our protector. Why? So that these sacraments can help us unto salvation. Um, when we look at the gift of the, the law, the, the Ten Commandments, on thy faithful who adore and confess thee evermore, in thy sevenfold gifts descend. So the, the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is um, so much greater, of course, than the law um, on the tablets, because how can we actually fulfill any law without that Holy Spirit. So we sing to the Holy Spirit, another a great song, On thy faithful who adore and confess thee evermore, in thy sevenfold gifts to sin. These are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Give them virtues, sure reward. Give them thy salvation, Lord. Give them joys that never end. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit that takes place first at Pentecost and then a personal Pentecost at each one of our confirmations, which is the sacrament of confirmation. We move now into the great king, the story of David. First, David and Goliath, this victory. This is going to point us to the victory of Jesus on Golgotha. We also see that David um, is a repentant person, a man over God's heart, David and Nathan. Um, this will kind of foreshadow the, the role of the penitent and the priest. And then the temple and the ark. And this is going to point us to Jesus Christ, who is the new temple, and Mary, who is the ark of the covenant. So when we look here at these types, uh, we see, of course, Jesus Christ is in the line of David. Um, he, is, he will establish the throne of David, um, which will be a kingdom. Uh, he'll sit on that throne and reign forever. But it behooves us to glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life and resurrection, by whom we are saved and delivered. And so just like David conquered Goliath, and severed the head of Goliath. It will be Jesus on Calvary. Golgotha means place of the skull. It'll be on Calvary that Jesus Christ will crush the head of Satan. You see here in that picture, you have Mary's foot and Jesus's foot 
crushing that snake, the head of Satan, um, so that we can be saved and delivered. Um, we see David and Nathan, and Nathan being the prophet that's calling David out. Nathan there is like the priest. David is the penitent. Thou hast mercy upon us, O Lord, and hatest none of the things which thou hast made, overlooking the sins of men for the sake of repentance and sparing them. Where does this take place? Where does he wipe away our sins and spare us? This is, of course, in the, in the confessional penitent and priest, just like David and Nathan. Um, and then one of the most beautiful typologies I think there is, Jesus Christ as the new temple and Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So in this typology, it's so beautiful. It's because the Ark, Mary, is like the Ark of the Covenant, which will contain Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be in this Ark. In the Old Testament, we see there was the Ark that had the greatest things of the Old Testament in, contained within it. In the New Testament, we'll see Mary, who contains Jesus Christ himself, um, who is the shepherd, who is the living bread, who is the lawgiver. Um, and so we see uh, kind of a reversal here too, uh, just very simple, that the ark was placed in the temple in the Old Testament. It'll be the temple, Jesus Christ, that will be placed within the ark, Mary, and the New Testament. The Israelite people have a great king. They, have, uh, they will soon have a temple. They have a city, Jerusalem. They have everything but they lose it all. They lose it all through the Babylonian exile. They have rejected God um, and they lose everything. And so we see that David, of course, is not the end. It will be something greater. It will be Jesus Christ. And particularly here, we're gonna be looking at Jesus Christ as um, Emmanuel, God with us, the epiphany, the manifestation of God, and then of course, the eternal and new testament of the Eucharist. And so we see that all of these Old Testament uh, books, the 46, um, in which we highlighted Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David, these are all pointing, they're all types, all pointing to, of course, that final E, Emmanuel, Epiphany, and the Eucharist. This is Jesus Christ. All of these are pointing to Jesus. So in this lesson, we're going to look at those 20 in depth and all the things that I just spoke about but how they point and come to their completion with Jesus Christ. Um, I think it's important for us to remember that we are the poor banished children of Eve. After this exile, we are currently in exile. Um, not Just like in the Old Testament, the people are in exile waiting for Jesus, we are currently in exile as well, waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Um, in the Old Testament, the people were like sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one to his own way. Everyone has turned aside to his own way. This is Isaiah 53, 6. So we see very clearly in the Old, Old Testament people that were exiled and longing for Jesus. We now are like exiles longing for Jesus. While we long for Jesus, while we long for his second coming, coming though, we understand some realities that of the Emmanuel. God is with us right now. God is with us. The epiphany, that, um, that manifestation of God, that Jesus Christ truly is God. This was shown in his life. This was shown in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then this great gift of himself, the Eucharist, Jesus Christ gives himself to us, the new and eternal testament in the Eucharist. Um, with these, Emmanuel, Epiphany, and Eucharist, we see kind of the core message here, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God, he took on flesh, so therefore God is now with us. He manifests himself through his life, through his passion, through his death, through his resurrection. He manifests, he shows that he is God, and he is dwelling with us, but then he continues to dwell with us through the Eucharist, through his church, through his sacraments. And this is, of course, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The key here, the, the kernel here, John 1, 14. Thank you for joining me for this Animode short lesson, this introduction in the kingdom of God, and particularly the kingdom of God as a teaching church, um, that the church will teach, sanctify, and govern, and this lesson on teaching. Uh, please take the time to watch the other videos in this series and uh, check out our cards, our Animode game cards. 
uh, which will be helpful in matching up the Old Testament and New Testament. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.